Now, like I said, this is a great sort of segue into the fact that, well, if you've got one form, why do you care about giving it a name if there aren't other forms? And there are other forms. Now, in the scope of the extension 2 course, there's only one other form that I'm going to tell you about, okay? And you'll probably be relieved by the time you get to this second form, you're like, okay, this is hard, my brain hurts a little bit, I don't even want to get to this third form, which is a bit of a shame. The third form, I think, is the best one, but if you want, I can explain it later. This is rectangular form, right? This next form is called, again, it's got a bunch of different names, but my favorite, just like rectangular form, my favorite name for the next thing is called polar form. Okay. Now draw for me, please, another Argan diagram. Can you do that for me? So is the y-axis intentionally dotted on the first one? So the y-axis are dotted here because when I first introduced this to us as an idea, right, it's kind of like, well, yes, these are all of the numbers. These are all of them. Like, what is this? Where is this coming from? Does it even exist? Like, you can't measure it. You can't say, oh, yeah, I grew, I grew, I centimeters this year, which I did because I didn't grow at all, right? Like, what does that mean? Do, can this be quantified? So I put it in as a dotted axis to represent. It's something different, but there's no reason why you have to. It would be a bit of a pain if you kept on drawing dotted ones. Just wanted to highlight its difference. Now, on this new Argan diagram, and again, let's make sure we represent the imaginary part and the real part and label them as such. Let's pick out a point, let's pick out a point. And um, if I call this guy over here, x plus i, y, right? I can represent this in a different way using a different pair of decimal expansions, a different pair of numbers, if I imagine this point on the circumference of a circle, okay? Now, just pause with me for a second. I'm gonna draw this circle in but you're immediately going to ask, like, why? Why would you do that? Like, what makes you think that, okay? Now, I'm not going to tell you the answer just yet, but I hope I justify it for you enough by going back to what Harry said before. Now, we know there are lots of ways to write a straight line. You learnt this under linear functions earlier this year, okay? This form, of course, is called? This is, this is slope intercept form, right? Give me another one. General form, right? So that's fine. Give me another one. Point gradient. Give me another one. Two point. Mm. Give me another one. You can't think of another one? Really? Come on. Haven't you met this one? This guy's useful. What's this one called? Does anyone know what this one's called? This is intercept form, right? For those of you, I'm just judging by the looks on your faces, right? If you let x equal zero, you let x equal zero, right? Why, for what reason would you let x equal zero? To find the y-intercept, right? So when x equals zero, this guy disappears. So what's y equal to? B. So some value, right? So you're like, oh, I found my y-intercept. When y equals zero, why would you let y equal zero? Why would you do that? to find the x-intercept. When y equals zero, x is going to be? That's kind of useful, isn't it? Okay. Now, that's a demonstration, right? Why do we have five, why five forms for the same thing? It's, you can write the same line in five different ways. Because depending on the way you write it, it's useful for a different purpose. Do you agree? Right? Um, the, again, French guy. Henri Poincaré, right? His quote about mathematics, his description of what mathematics is, is mathematics is the art of giving the same name to different things. It's the art of giving the same name to different things. His principle was, you look at, um, you look at who's awake. Okay, Jack is reasonably awake. Catch, Jackie, there you go. Okay, you saw that whiteboard marker fly through the air, right? Pass it back. Okay. Thank you. Okay. It flew through the air. What shape did it make? It made a parabola, right? It made a parabola. You could fire um, a hose through the air, it would make the same thing. You could fire a rocket around the sun and it would make the same shape. And mathematicians say, all the same object. They are all the same object, actually. Any object under the force of gravity, if it has the right acceleration, will trace out a parabola, okay? 
Now, we have the art of giving the same name to different things, but also taking the same object and looking at it from different angles. Because every time you get a new angle, you gain insight. Right? Now, that's what polar form is about. So for now, put to one side why you would do this and have the expectation that the reason will become clear. Okay? Because it will, I promise. Right? Now, let's come back. I said, imagine it on the circumference of a circle. Draw the circle for me now. Center at the origin. So it's going to look something like this. Okay? Now, when you've got it on the circumference of a circle, you can see, hey, wait a second. I'm used to expressing two points here, Cartesian coordinates, in terms of a circle, except I'm usually used to the unit circle, right? Which means radius one, okay? But let's be a bit more general than that because we don't expect that it has to be on a circle of radius one. So I'm just gonna call the radius R, okay? Now, on the unit circle, what are the x and y coordinates again of any point on the circumference? You're going to use tree functions, right? You may remember, I'll write it up here because I don't want to cloud it with what we're doing right now. You may remember it's cos theta sine theta. Maybe the way you remembered that was that it was alphabetical, just like x and y are. But where it comes from, and you should know this well enough as extension students to prove it, is this right angle triangle in here. That's what cos and sine are about, right? They're, they're hiding your right angle triangles. You're like, where's the right angle triangle in a circle? Answer, they're everywhere, okay? So if I define theta as this angle here, can you show me how I get the cos and the sine out? What's this distance? Have a look. This distance is x, right? It's the real part of the complex number, okay? But using trig, I can say, wait, 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 hold on a second. This side and this side are connected with what ratio? This is adjacent and a hypotenuse. This is cosine. Right? So because cos theta, cos theta is x on r adjacent on hypotenuse, I can rewrite this with x as the subject. It's r cos theta. Right? Does that make sense? So r cos theta is another way that I can write x. And in the same way, what's this distance up here? This is, well, I'm labeling it y, but I can use trig to show in the same way that that's r sine theta, right? Now, it looks more complicated, but using these, I can say, instead of writing it in rectangular form, x plus i, y, and my two numbers are horizontal position and vertical position, I can write it using these. I'm just going to substitute them straight in, right? Instead of writing x, I'm going to write r cos theta. Instead of writing i, y, I'm going to write i times r sine theta. Does that make sense? Right? Because i and there's y, right? So i r sine theta. Clearly, I have a common factor, namely r. So I'll just take that out. And I'm going to write something in a second just so that you recognize it, but I actively discourage you from using it. So watch out. Have a look here. Um, theta, right? Theta is going to be the same for both of them. They, these two sides, they inhabit the same triangle, right? So whatever that theta is, it's going to be the same for each of these. It's not like you've got one theta here and another theta there, okay? So people get really sick of writing cos i sine, cos i sine. So they contract it like this. They pronounce it cis, which basically expresses how I feel about this because I discourage you from using this. Here's why. Okay, I'll give you two reasons. Number one, for all of you who are going to study any mathematics at uni, boy, are they going to cane you for writing that, okay? Because it's not really accepted in the broader mathematical community. It's a nice hack and it's faster, okay? But they're not going to be happy with you doing that. So if you've got an engineering or science degree anywhere in your future, erase this from your mind, okay? Secondly, secondly, what's the point of writing it like this? What's the point of complex numbers? And the answer is, it's about saying, look, there's two parts to this. There's an x and there's an i, y, right? There's a cos theta and there's an i sine theta. And they're two different pieces. I've been trying to labor to you the fact that unlike every other real number ever, complex numbers refuse to be simplified in this way, okay? But do you see that this way of writing it, quicker as it is, and mathematicians love speed because they are famously lazy, it kind of 
takes away from the fact that actually there's two bits. There's two bits. They're supposed to be separate, okay? So that is why sometimes you will see this. You'll see some textbooks use it, some exams even use it. So you need to know what it means. It means this. But I personally wouldn't be caught dead writing it except to tell you, hey, this is what it means, and now I'm going to rub it off the board, okay? So in case you see it, now you know how to interpret it. But even though it's going to take you a whole two and a half seconds longer, I'm going to insist in this classroom, you write cos theta plus pi sine theta, okay? Does anyone know why it's called polar form? Polar form? Polar form. Our planet, uh, it's got two poles, doesn't it? It's got, well, it's got more than two poles. But uh, popularly speaking, you've got the North Pole and you've got the South Pole, right? Now we use these two poles to describe every point on the surface of the planet just using two numbers, right? I just need to know what angle of rotation do you have, right? So this is what, where compass bearings come from. It's like how far are you away from north or how far are you away from south, okay? And then you've got this other number. What does this number mean? This is a distance, right? So this is like, how far would you like me to turn? I can turn anywhere you like, right? And then once I'm facing in the right direction, theta, then I just want you to tell me how far to walk, okay? That's R, right? So again, you're like, man, complex numbers, these math students are obsessed with names, right? Because these are such important ideas, we give them other special names, right? We call this guy R, we call it the modulus. And if your complex number is z, we write that as z with two absolute value signs around it. And you're like, why? I'll get to that in a second. And then secondly, this guy down here, the angle, we call it the argument. Okay? The argument. Modulus argument. Now, remember I said to you there's other names for this? So it's often not called polar form because this form here depends on a modulus out the front and an argument in here, it's often also called mod arg form. Okay? So if you hear someone in the library stressing out on Friday, oh, you don't have a library. If you hear someone outside the MPC stressing out on Friday and like, oh, how do you turn it into mod arg form? This is what they're talking about, right? They're trying to convert between this way of writing things and that way, or back and forth. Okay? So mod arg form, polar form, all the same deal. 